Alexander, are you ready? Yes, I can. So uh, Alexander Bufetov will now give his third lecture on um, determinantal point processes. Thank you very much. We will now uh, discuss a little bit the general theory of determinantal point processes. So uh, let us <coughs> uh, recall that uh, last two times we treated three examples. So the example of the classical sine kernel of Dyson. <clears throat> so, and uh, let me again uh, recall in this connection that the projection, the sine kernel is a spectral projection, so it acts in L2 of R, and it sends a function, so one takes the Fourier transform, one restricts the Fourier transform to minus pi pi, and takes the inverse Fourier transform, and also let me point out that the sine kernel, by its very definition, by expanding the sine, so it has so-called integrable form. So integrable form in its uh, greatest generality uh, means that uh, the commutator with the operator of multiplication by the variable has finite rank. But in our situation, uh, when I say integrable form, I will mean so uh, the form, maybe to, it's better to say Christoffel Darbou form. So the form that in fact uh, it, it ha looks like the Christoffel Darbou formula. So here it is. So and uh, does indeed come from the Christoffel Darbou formula. So the sine kernel, as I mentioned in the first class, uh, arises by taking the limit of Hermite polynomial. So in the Christoffel Darbou formula, one gets exactly this. So, okay, so then we discussed uh, the completely, so, uh, okay, let me go a little bit unchronologically. Then we discussed the discrete sine kernel, so the discrete cousin of this kernel. So there is, observe, a difference between the two in that the continuous sine kernel is only one. So I could put a parameter here, but in fact all these parameters are taken one into another by homotities. So the discrete sine kernel, excuse me, the continuous sine kernel is only one, whereas the discrete sine kernel, it's a family. It's a family, it's one parameter family. And again, I have S alpha to F, it's again the same, F hat minus alpha over two over two, uh, but this formula is written on the torus. So uh, this function is an L2 of R mod Z. So again, by its very definition, the discrete sine kernel has <coughs> has integrable form, and in fact, uh, at the, uh, so let me s immediately make an observation that will be important f as this talk proceeds, especially for the discussion of the Gibbs property. Uh, let me make the observation that at the corner of this, in at the, uh, the cornerstone for this integrable property is the following uh, property, which maybe it's possible to call weak division property, weak division property for my uh, projectors. So these are projection operators, the, this one and this one, and the weak division property. So if I have a space L, so it's a Hilbert space, a Hilbert space, so Hilbert space admitting a reproducing kernel, admitting a reproducing kernel. So what do I mean by Hilbert space admitting a reproducing kernel? I mean that uh, value of function at a point so admitting a reproducing kernel, let's say, let's denote it pi x, y. So what I mean by this, I mean that for f and l, the value of function of f at a point, f of x, is equal to the inner product of f, let's write f of y, is equal to the inner product of f and the reproducing kernel pi at y. So in other words, this just means that projection onto l is given by a kernel, a situation that we will uh, consider so, uh, by phi of x is the inner product by x of y, phi of y dy. So precisely, uh, the projection is given by a kernel, uh, and uh, uh, this precisely means that the, uh, that the 
uh, operation of taking the value of a function at a point is given by taking the inner product with the kernel. And so if I have such uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, then uh, the weak division property is uh, formulated as follows. So that if f is in L and f, the value of f at some function is equal to zero, again, why I can take the value of function at a point because of this, the value of function at a point is a continuous functional. So then f over x minus p belongs to L. This is the weak division property that I use. So it is not very difficult to check the weak division property, for example, for the sine kernel. So uh, let me check it at, for p equals zero, the general case is the same. For p equals zero, so let's see. Uh, let's go to the Fourier side. So what does it mean? Uh, let's go to the Fourier side. What does it mean? f of zero equals to zero. It means that the Fourier transform has zero average. So a function has zero average. And it, it belongs to the range of L, it belongs to minus pi pi. So a function of zero average belongs to minus pi pi. So what does it mean to divide by x? It means to take the antiderivative. So if a function has zero average and is supported on minus pi pi, then it admits an antiderivative which is again supported on minus pi pi. So, and this is proved for the sign kernel. But in fact, <clears throat> it is possible to prove, it is possible to prove this property. So any kernel, so remark, so let me make two remark. Remark one, remark one. Any kernel, any kernel of the form. A of x, b of y. So I will call it integrable form even though the word integrable form is used in more general context. It goes back to the work of uh, Izergin Karepin Slavnov, it's again Karevin Slavnov, but I will use it in this specific setup. So any kernel of this form, of integrable form, obeys the weak division property. Obeys the weak division property. Property. So uh, this can be checked. And also remark two, uh, so which is joint from joint work with Roman Romanov. Uh, so from 2018, also that the converse holds. So if L, a reproducing kernel space, obeys the weak division property, the weak division property, property, uh, then <coughs> in fact the kernel pi is integrable so pi has the form, let me denote it, star. Pi has the form star. And furthermore, and furthermore, and L is a space of holomorphic functions. A space of holomorphic functions. So I'm not saying, so these are spaces of entire functions, but in fact I'm not saying that, and in fact it's not true. So is a space of holomorphic functions. I am not specifying. I am not specifying on what, because in fact this cannot be specified, as is shown by the example of the Bessel kernel. So it is not space of entire functions because the kernel might have singularity at some point, like precisely the Bessel kernel. The Bessel kernel, which we saw in the talk of Tomohiro Sasamoto, uh, has. Uh, power singular, I, I mean the continuous Bessel kernel, not the one that we did in class here. So the continuous Bessel kernel, it has power singularity at zero, so it is not an entire function, it is still a holomorphic function in the neighborhood of the domain of definition, and so the statement still holds. Uh, so uh, in fact it is, an, uh, uh, it is an if and only if, so it is a space of holomorphic functions. In fact, for holomorphic functions, for spaces of holomorphic functions of such type, the division property is quite clear, in fact. Okay, uh, so uh, this is a characterization of these operators having integrable form, which will be important uh, as our discussion proceeds. And uh, uh, let me formulate uh, a very naive open question. So the result that we proved with Roman Romanov, it's a very short proof, it's a, a 10 page note. Uh, just uh, we, when we proved it, we proved it, we thought we proved it both in continuous case and in discrete case. 
But in discrete case, we quickly found a mistake, so, and we did not put it in the node. So you will see that uh, for discrete case, the part, so the part about integrable form, it's completely general. It's abstract, abstract, it's abstract essentially algebraic identity with resolvents. But with space of holomorphic functions, while it is true that all examples in discrete case, which at least I know, come from Bessel functions or gamma functions or some, some uh, classical functions, so the result about space of holomorphic functions we don't have in discrete case. And so this is a question which seems to me should be completely uh, realistic to solve. So is the second claim true in discrete case? Is the second claim true in discrete case? We do not have proof of that. So question, is the second claim true in discrete case? In discrete case. Okay. So, uh, third example which we considered uh, today and uh, which we considered, excuse me, uh, during first class and which I will not consider in detail today is a different sort of example is the <coughs> uh, Bergman kernel and we will return to it, to the Bergman kernel later. So, this, set, uh, this example I leave a little bit aside for today. Uh, but I want to start today by, in fact, uh, as, I said, as I mentioned, developing some general theory. And so in the first place, by proving an existence theorem for determinantal point processes. So let us recall, before proving the existence, let us recall what is it that we, uh, whose existence we prove. So we say, so we, we pick uh, K, a locally trace class operator. So, okay, let me start differently. So we pick some space E. So in our examples, E will be R or maybe C or maybe Z, so some very simple space. But uh, in general, we just say that E is a Polish space. So, and mu sigma finite measure on E, sigma finite measure on E. So K is an operator, is a locally trace class operator. So uh, again, uh, let us just naively, one can just, one could just say that K is a continuous function in two variables. Locally trace class operator acting on, acting on L2 of uh, E mu. So, uh, but again, please, if this uh, terminology is not clear, so uh, how do I say? Simpler version, simpler version, k continuous functions to variables. k continuous in, in continuous function of two variables, continuous in two variables. So let's say bounded, bounded continuous into variables. Continuous into variables. Sometimes we will uh, consider unbounded cases also, precisely as in the case of Bessel process, but. Uh, this is uh, not very important for the moment. So generally, locally trace class operator acting on L2E of mu. Okay, and then as, uh, as uh, uh, I mentioned during, uh, as I mentioned first, uh, during the first class, a point process is called determinantal, so a point process P, that is to say, a measure, a Borel measure on the space of configurations on the space of configurations of E is called determinantal if if uh, the else correlation function, so th let's write the else correlation measure is the determinant of K xi xj product d mu of xi. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I will also, as, the, as uh, today we progress, I will also give different definition of a determinant point process, uh, uh, which will be more convenient, equivalent but more convenient. Uh, which uh, avoids the use of uh, correlation functions. Let me just first, uh, as we start with this, let me just first say, so uh, my first aim for today is to discuss the question of existence of such process. Why does such process exist? And uh, let me point out that uh, the non-triviality of this question is underlined by the fact that, you know, the sign process of 
Dyson has been formulated, has been written down by Dyson in the 60s, but its existence uh, is a theorem of the new millennium. Uh, so, uh, how to say, a conceptual framework for its existence uh, was created in the new millennium. In fact, uh, the French physicist Odile Maquis, so she's uh, the pioneer of the, uh, in 75, she started the study of determinantal point process, which she, she called fermionic point process, but she proved a version of a theorem which I will now formulate, but she did not prove, in fact, she did not, her, the result she proved was, did not go far enough to prove the existence of the sign process. So, in fact, it took quite a while to, <coughs> to uh, formulate some conditions which I now will formulate. And also, let me say that the, the, the theorem I will formulate now, the theorem of Maki Soshnikov, also uh, proved by Shirai and Takahashi, so this theorem does not is a very uh, nice sufficient condition, but it is not a criterion. So in general, this question, the question remains open. So the question, uh, under, what assumptions, under what assumptions, when does what kernels K induce, what kernels K induce a determinantal point process, induce a determinantal point process, this question remains open. And there are important examples. In fact, uh, one of them we briefly saw in uh, Laszlo Erdős talk, the Dyson Brownian motion. So there are important examples which are not covered by a general conceptual framework. So the examples come as the examples coming from non-self-adjoint kernels, there does not exist a general framework to prove existence of such processes. Okay, so uh, let me formulate the theorem of Maki Soshnikov, Shirai, and Takahashi. Uh, okay, so theorem, as I said, weaker version of this theorem was formulated by Odile Maki in the 70s, and then uh, 25 years elapsed, and Soshnikov completed uh, the program of Maki, and also simultaneously and independently, Shirai and Takahashi proved the same result. So, a theorem of oh, Maki, Soshnikov, Shirai and Takahashi is the following, that if K, so K emission and uh, contractive, then PK exists. K exists. So as I mentioned, if it exists, it is unique, and in fact, this I will also explain in different way right now. With this, in fact, I will start. Uh, so, because the moment problem is well posed in this situation, so if it exists, it is unique, but the main question, does it actually exist? So, uh, the uh, theorem is that it exists. So, uh, the theorem that Maki proved initially was like this. So, but in fact, in most important examples, in most examples that we consider, it is in fact the projections, projections that emerge. So, also let me say that, uh, uh, so let me repeat that in many examples, such as the Dyson Brown in motion, the kernel that induces, uh, uh, that induces it is not self adjoint. It is not self adjoint, and for such cases, there does not exist a general framework, only some examples. And finally, also let me mention that determinantal point processes have a cousin, have a cousin where instead of the determinant, one writes the Pfaffian. So, and the Pfaffian cousin, is much poorer than the, det the determinantal one. So in fact, in Pfaffian case, there, does, there do not exist general results of this type. So uh, there is no, so uh, there exists, there is work of Kargin, but the examples do not satisfy these criteria. So there exist results, but which do not prove the existence of examples. So uh, sign process has a Pfaffian cousin, the Pfaffian sign process, but its existence cannot be proved conceptually. It can only, the existence can only be established by a limit transition. So in Pfaffian situation, in Pfaffian situation, uh, there does not exist analog of Maki Soshnikov, Shirai Takahashi theorem, just, uh, which I also I think uh, stresses, uh, underlines its non-triviality, despite the fact that the proof is very short. So the proof, uh, the proof can be given in two lines. And proof can be given in two lines. Okay, so uh, 
before I proceed to the proof, uh, let me discuss the question of uniqueness. And in fact, uh, to address this question, it will be convenient for me to reformulate, to reformulate the determinantal property. And in fact, it will be convenient to me to introduce a formalism which I will use a lot, uh, which I will use all the time, the formalism of multiplicative, multiplicative functionals. The formalism of multiplicative functionals. So multiplicative functionals of point processes. So uh, the, a point process is a measure on configurations, is a measure on configurations. So as we discussed, uh, configuration is itself a measure. So it's a measure on measures. So it is very useful, naturally, if I have a measure on measures, it is very useful. So the quantities that I want to compute are precisely integrals of some functions with respect to my underlying measures. Saying this uh, in uh, a different way, it is very useful to consider additive functionals on the space of configurations. So an additive function on the space of configuration is just expression of this form. So we recall, uh, let me recall the notation, that space of configurations is, is the space of uh, subsets, or is the space of subsets. Each configuration is a collection of particles. So, and just I sum values of a function over the particles. So for may, uh, just not to ask oneself why the sum converges, let us assume that F has compact support. So this is additive functional, additive functional, and for example, in particular, the expectation of the additive, the expectation of the additive functional is, of course, the integral of f with respect to the first correlation measure. So this is just uh, a the definition, or essentially the definition of the first correlation measure. So it is, however, very useful to consider Laplace transforms of these quantities. Or, in other words, to consider the multiplicative functionals. In Soviet literature, there also existed the term Bogolubov functionals. So, uh, psi g of x, I will consider products of values of a function over, uh, over particles. So, assuming that g, for example, just for the moment, assuming g is such that g minus 1 has compact support. G minus one has compact support. So then this product converges. And then this product converges. So, and now I can reformulate in these terms, I can reformulate the determinantal property. And in fact, I will write it, and it is more convenient for me. So I will reformulate it in the following way. So I will write that the expectation of a multiplicative functional is equal to the determinant 1 plus g minus 1 k and so g supported g supported g supported g minus 1 supported in some bounded b supported in b so i regularize Determined by putting high B here. Okay, so uh, this is definition of a determinant of a process in terms of multiplicative functionals. The advantage of this definition is that it is clear that such process is unique. So there is no question that such process is unique because, in fact, uh, a multiplicative function, so why do values of multiplicative functionals determine a point process uniquely? It is because the following quantity is a multiplicative functional. I write Z1, well, Z2 hash B2, and ZL hash BL. Let us recall here that hash B is just of a configuration, is just the intersection, the cardinality of the intersection of X and B. <coughs> And uh, just the, so as we discussed in first class, a measure on the space of configurations is essentially by definition a collection of joint distributions of these, 
of these random variables. By the way, a question that I did not discuss in first lecture, and the question which is quite non-trivial, is what conditions must this joint distribution satisfy? So there are obviously conditions, uh, consistency conditions, but I'm completely skipping this. So uh, it is, so what conditions must correlation functions satisfy in order to induce a point process? This is a non-trivial question. This is a non-trivial question. There are some conditions uh, developed by Lenard in Princeton, but uh, it's a non-trivial question. I really don't even want to uh, discuss it in greater detail. One can look at the survey of Soshnikov, precisely where this theorem is proved from 2000 in the Russian mathematical surveys. They're all written down in detail and just somehow to illustrate how it is very difficult to use them. Uh, so uh, in any event, it is clear that such quantity determines the joint distributions uniquely and so in particular determines the point process uniquely, determines the point process uniquely. So precisely knowing the values of expectations of multiplicative functions determines the point process uniquely, which is what I wanted to say. Uh, but again, this does not give any clue about existence. This does not give any clue about existence. It is very difficult to check whether such point process exists. And indeed, again, if instead of determinant I write Pfaffian, I don't know any way of checking this. Also, let me say a few words about the determinant. So in this method of writing, this is just the Fredholm determinant, just the very usual Fredholm determinant. At the same time, it will be more convenient for me to use not the Fred, so the disadvantage of the Fredholm determinant is that the Fredholm determinant is only defined for trace class operators. So this operator has to have finite trace in order that one be able to write the expansion of uh, Fredholm determinant as a power series. Uh, but uh, in fact, it is more convenient to work not with the Fredholm determinant, but with the Hilbert Kalimann regularization of the Fredholm determinant. And in fact, so let us write. So in many examples, it, I will use the notation that one plus some operator. Let me write uh, R is exponential of the Diag of the diagonal of the kernel of the, di of the diagonal values d mu of x times what I call determinant 2 of 1 plus r. So what does it mean determinant 2 of 1 plus r? Let me write this here. So this is precisely the Hilbert Carleman, the Hilbert Carleman regularization. Determinant 2 of 1 plus r is in fact e to the minus trace of r determinant 1 plus r. So let me explain what, so you might, you might say, what have I achieved by multiplying and dividing? I have achieved something because this expression, determinant 2, is defined, so as opposed to this expression, this expression is only defined if r has finite trace, if r is a trace class operator, so each multiple is defined. Their product, on the other hand, so if one thinks of determinant as by what's called Litsky theorem, uh, by Litsky theorem, if one thinks of determinant as product of one plus eigenvalues. So this expression is defined if sum of squares of eigenvalues converges. So that is to say, if R is Hilbert Schmidt, if R is Hilbert Schmidt, this whole expression. So this whole expression is defined for Hilbert Schmidt operator rather than for finite trace operator. So, and indeed, <coughs> So the point of Hilbert uh, was to define determinant for Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And so this is regularized determinant, which is defined. And this expression is often, can often be defined even in situations when the operator is not finite trace. So precisely look at this operator. So without this. So it's, this is defined and this is defined. So, uh, yes, so this operator is clearly, this operator is clearly Hilbert-Schmidt if G has compact support. It is, however, much less clear. In fact, I don't know how to prove it. I don't know how to check it under what assumptions such operator has finite trace. And so there are two ways out of it. As I said, one can add that chi B, but it seems to me that a more convenient way is to understand the symbol determinant in this, in this specific sense, and then the formula makes sense. We shall see that this formula is much more convenient uh, for, for some reasons. This formula is much more convenient than the one before. Of course, it is also possible to consider symmetrized version, why I can also write determinant one plus g minus one, k g minus one. 
Okay. So this much, so, uh, so in order to take determinant one plus something self-adjoint. <coughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, this much for different definition of the <coughs> uh, determinant point process and also for the question of uniqueness, which now we have completely covered. So now let me go for the proof of the theorem, proof. So, and the proof uh, is, in fact, inductive. The proof is, in fact, inductive. And let me start with operator of rank 1. So, first case, rank k equals 1. So, let me start with, and let me start with a projection. So, k is one-dimensional projection. So, k is one-dimensional projection. So, that is to say, k is the operator, k f is f phi phi. This is operator of one dimensional projection. In this case, so what does it mean if one looks at the formulas carefully? So in fact, maybe it's easier to look at the formula. So by the way, let me, excuse me, let me say that this formula is quite equivalent to the formula with correlation functions. This follows just by expressing the determinant as a series, expressing the determinant as a series of traces and taking, for example, g in the form uh, 1 plus epsilon something and expanding in powers of epsilon, one gets precisely the formula that was there before. So, and uh, in definition of correlation functions, it is clear that all the, all the determinants arising in the definition of correlation functions will be zero except the first one. So there is only one particle. And it is clear by, uh, again, kxx, kxx is equal to phi square. It is clear that uh, the, uh, there is one particle distributed with probability density phi square. Already here, uh, let me make an observation which will be uh, important in what follows, that observe that the function phi does not have a meaning in terms of point process. So the square of the function phi has a meaning, but the function phi itself doesn't. In fact, if I change function phi, if I multiply it by some function of unit, or, or, or function of, uh, of unit norm, function uh, in, taking values in the unit circle, then the process will not change. So there is a significant, so a kernel uniquely defines a process, but the process does not uniquely define a kernel. So the process does not define a kernel uniquely. Uh, there is some freedom in choosing the kernel. So there is the freedom of this type multiplying by something and dividing by something. Again, it is uh, clear from the definition of the determinant that if k is multiplied by some function and divided by the same function uh, in the other variable, then uh, the determinant doesn't change. So the, these determinants just do not change. But it is uh, an open question, for example, if there are two self-adjoint kernels which induce the same process, is it true that they are, one is taken into another by such gauge transformation? This is not clear. This is not clear. Or uh, when do two kernels induce the same process? This is not clear. Okay, so, uh, but in any event, here it is, uh, here is the case of rank k equals 1. So, okay, let's do rank k equals 2. k equals 2. So, kf is f phi 1 phi 1 plus f phi 2 phi 2 phi 1 and phi 2 are orthogonal. So, then, again, one can check. The first correlation function, well, is what it is. The second correlation function is just, so, the determinant, in fact. So the second correlation function will be just uh, the determinant phi 1 of x, phi 1 of y, phi 2 of x, phi 2 of y square. The square in absolute value, okay, square. Very nice. So this is a point process with two particles and with this density. So it remains to check, but it can be checked uh, that uh, you, uh, it checked in the way which I explained in the first class. 
uh, when we discussed the correlation functions of the when we discussed the correlation functions of the uh, uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble. So one can check that the process with this density, with this density, if you integrate in the second variable, you get the first correlation function. The first correlation function. So uh, the first correlation function will, of course, be phi 1 square plus phi 2 square. Okay, and so false. So one has to check, it's a, it's a verification that has to be done, that distribution on pairs of particles with this density, in fact, has this first correlation function. But this is immediate. Same for three, for four, and so on. And so the last step, which I will, uh, the details I will leave as an exercise, is that now approximate, approximate a general, pro approximate a general projection K, projection K by finite dimensional ones. By finite dimensional ones and obtain the process. And obtain the process. So in fact, any not only not only self-adjoint uh, projection, but in fact any self-adjoint contraction can be approximate. So uh, why I skip the details? Because the details, while not difficult, are somewhat messy. So approximate in what sense? Uniformly and compact sets. Uh, what does it mean? How do the measure converge? The measure converge in vague sense. Why, uh, so why is this enough? Because uh, these are probability measures and so the end measure will also be a probability measure and so on. So there are some details to fill in, but in fact uh, the Again, uh, no difficulty, but uh, some routine details. But uh, this gives the proof of the theorem of Makisochnikov, Shirai, and Takahashi. So I should say, by the way, that Sochnikov's approach was a little bit different. In fact, Sochnikov started with a uh, Sochnikov following Maki started with a contraction. So let me, by the way, let me pursue a, 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 a short digression. So uh, a short digression, uh, just how originally the theorem was proved. And by the way, this short digression will allow me also to motivate this formula. So digression. Uh, so let us imagine So let us imagine that we have a matrix L, some matrix. So, uh, unfo so I will use the symbol L, so this digression, I use the notation which is used by Borodin Dalshansky, but in fact I will, it's one and only time that I denote matrix by L. So, and so they call it L process, L process, because in fact I will use the word L for subspace routinely. Okay, but anyway, so just for this one minute, L is a matrix, as uh, Borodin Dalshansky write it. So L is a matrix, uh, and so uh, let's say positive definite, positive definite, positive definite. And I give the probability so matrix, let's say M times M. So probability measure, I give a probability measure on one M, on, excuse me, on the set of subsets, obviously, on two, on the set of subsets of the set one M, by writing, so how do I give it? Right, P of X is determinant of one plus LX. So in other words, we start with the formula determinant, uh, oh, excuse me, determinant LX, excuse me, I miswrote, determinant LX. So, excuse me, determinant LX. So start with the formula determinant one plus L is equal to sum of determinants LX. So, and realize that to have probability measure, in fact, I have to normalize by determinant one plus L. Determinant one plus L. So like this, I get, Probability measure. Like this, I get probability measure. Okay. So, uh, 
like this I get probability measure. And so now it is quite possible to check, so now one can check, that the expectation, so this is what uh, is called L process, so I can check that the expectation of multiplicative functional, again, again by writing this formula, will be equal to determinant 1 plus GL over determinant 1 plus L. Precisely by the same, so because in fact by definition this is uh, sum C of X determinant LX over determinant 1 plus L. This just like this. So, in fact, but this in turn can be written down as determinant 1 plus G inverse K, where K is L over 1 minus L. Uh, one can write inverse either the way you like. I mean, obviously, this is a commute. So, uh, end of story. So, this motivates this definition, except this formalism is more general than this formalism. One plus L, of course, excuse me, thank you very much. One plus L, thank you very much. Yes, in fact, precisely, thank you very much. So it's L, thank you very much, yes. It's L that is K1 minus K, yes. Thank you very much. Yes, so I miswrote, yes. So in fact, precisely, uh, thank you very much. Yes, so this formalism is more general than this formalism because here K is precisely a strict contraction. So as one can see, K is a strict contraction. And so in fact, the proof of Soshnikov, it works by taking the, this K, multiplying it by one minus epsilon, finding L, and then proving convergence for the limiting K. So this is the proof of Soshnikov, starting from here. Okay, very good. So uh, now that we have proved uh, the, uh, proved the uh, existence of determinant point processes, I would like to formulate a very simple proposition, uh, but which will be quite important for what follows. A uh, very simple proposition uh, about uh, behavior of multiplicative, uh, behavior of determinant point process when multiplied by a multiplicative function when multiplied by a multiplicative functional. So, uh, in fact, in fact, it is more or less clear here. So, if I have process of this type, already one can see it here. If I have process of this type, I started to erase a little bit too fast. Okay, if I have process of this type, determined by this kernel L, it is clear that if I multiply the kernel L by a function G, it corresponds to multiplying my process by a multiplicative functional. So, excuse me. So, let me write it. L, so some process, L process, L process P. So then GL, Psi G, P, with normalization, with normalization. So, uh, what I want to explain now is that this simple remark can in fact be uh, carried over in generality of determinantal point processes. That determinantal point, pro the determinantal property is preserved by multiplication by multiplicative function. Okay, so, and I pass to this uh, remark, to this proposition. So, a proposition from 2012. So, uh, multiplica uh, taking the pr product of a determinantal measure is and the multiplicative functional of a determinantal measure and the multiplicative, and the multiplicative functional is again determinantal measure and the multiplicative functional is again determinantal. F 
functional is again determinable. 2012. Functional is again determinable. So, and of this simple proposition, let me give a proof. So, in fact, it will be clear why I wanted to use this, why I wanted to use this definition of the determinant. In fact, let's consider a measure psi g p k. So, let pr so proof, proof, proof. So let k induce, let a kernel k induce the determinantal point process pk. Maybe, by the way, I did not process e pk, p, uh, so we write, we write p equals pk. Again, this notation, it's important to keep in mind that k determines pk, but p does not determine k. So the notation, so to speak, works only one way. Okay, so psi j pk. I want to prove that this, I aim to prove that this is determinantal. A induce pk, so let, and let g, so let psi g correspond to g, be multiplicative functional corresponding to g. Be multiplicative functional. So let psi g be product of, frankly, product of g. So, okay, so uh, to do this, I take one more multiplicative functional, psi h, and Okay, very good. And I have to divide by normalization, psi j, pk. So this is integration, of course, over space of configurations. So then I write 1 plus gh minus 1 k over 1 minus g minus 1. And again, so uh, then this is equal, in fact, to 1 plus h minus 1 g k, 1 plus g minus 1 k inverse. So one can check by uh, if this is just an identity with determinants. So, and this is the new kernel. So let me point out, so, is it possible to see from this blackboard? Is, is it okay? Yes, for some reason I always end up here where it's difficult to see. Is it, is it okay? Yes, is it visible? So the, okay, so the, <coughs> the uh, this is just identity with determinants. Some effort is needed to justify this multiplicativity property, but it can be done. <clears throat> this multiplicativity property for this regularized determinant, but it can be done. And so uh, this is uh, the end of the proof. Yes, let me point out that this operator, of course, is invertible because this otherwise, so this determinant has to be non-zero. So in, I have the right of inverting this operator. So, and just the proposition is proved. Let me make a remark that it will be very important for us uh, in the discussion of the Gibbs property, so probably tomorrow at this point, it will be very important for us uh, to take uh, conditions, to study conditions when these multiplicative functionals can actually be defined. So, to consider situations when these determinants need to be regularized, when one needs to consider regularized determinants. So when these functions are only, when these operators are only Hilbert-Schmidt and not uh, uh, trace class. And in fact, in some applications, in particular in consideration of Genebra process, it is important to consider situations also when these operators are not even Hilbert-Schmidt, when they belong to some higher Schatten class to some third Schatten class or something like this. Okay, but in any event, for, this, uh, for the time being, this is just uh, enough for us. And let me formulate, uh, let me formulate uh, uh, some property of, let me formulate some property 
uh, sub properties of this operator. So I can, it is sometimes convenient to symmetrize. It is sometimes convenient to symmetrize. To symmetrize. So what do I mean by symmetrize? Of course I can write. Okay, let me raise this and let me write. Here I can write that this is equal to <coughs> a determinant 1 plus h minus 1. I can symmetrize square root of g, k, 1 plus g inverse k, inverse square root of g. Uh, so to symmetrize. And then, so let me point out that if k is a projection, is a projection onto a subspace L, onto a subspace L, then kg, which is equal to square root of g, k, 1 plus g, is a projection onto the subspace, is a projection onto the subspace, the subspace, square root of G, L. Let us check this. Let us very quickly check this. <coughs> so proof. So in fact, if phi belongs, let's say phi belongs to of G, L, then, well, first we multiply. So let us, so square root of G, K, 1 plus g inverse k inverse square root of g of square square root of g phi. Uh, excuse me, of phi. So phi belongs to square root of g l. This means that phi is equal to square root of g psi psi in l. So k square root of g psi. So okay, here I have square root of g square root of g psi. Then here I have g psi. G psi. Okay, so I have to take the inverse of this on G psi. You can check that I get psi. Immediately it is clear that in fact applying this operator to psi gives G psi. So applying the inverse to G psi gives psi. So K psi is equal to psi and so I get square root of G psi which is phi. Which is what I wanted to begin with. So conversely, conversely phi is orthogonal to square root of G L which means that uh, phi, over, phi over square root of g is orthogonal to L, so is equal to, yes, so phi is equal to square root of g psi. So let me write like this, phi is equal to square root of g psi. Psi orthogonal to L, okay. So then again, I have square root of g psi times uh, g psi, uh, so I get g psi. So again, the inverse psi, but psi, I think, does my mind work? No. no. Maybe it just, no, now it works. Yeah. Okay, good. So yes, so now psi uh, just is orthogonal, so this part is the same. Psi is orthogonal to k, so it gives zero. So kj, kg. Phi is equal to zero. Kg phi is equal to zero. So uh, just uh, again, I think I need to stop quickly. So there is just uh, psi is uh, uh, orthogonal to L precisely. So k psi is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so kj phi is equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so uh, and just this is proved completely. Let me explain, let me explain this uh, property. So let me explain this property, uh, uh, illustrate this on the example of orthogonal polynomial ensembles. So in fact, if we consider, so the, an orthogonal polynomial ensemble, which we considered, uh, which we saw many times in this school. So let's consider orthogonal polynomial ensemble. Uh, so, dxi.
So this, of course, is a determinantal point process, as we discussed in the very first class, uh, corresponding to the projection onto the on x to the n minus 1 square root of w. Very good. So now if I consider this measure times a multiplicative functional, if I consider this measure times a multiplicative functional, so I write, so this is p, so I write psi g p, this is equal to, well, the same van der Monde, times g of xi, w of xi, dxi. So this will clearly be a gain orthogonal polynomial ensemble corresponding to the subspace. Well, clearly. I multiply the weight, I multiply Okay, so it is clear that LG, so it is clear that LG is equal to square root of GL. So just, it is clear. Observe, however, observe, however, that it is much less clear how to write the kernel, how to write the kernel for this new orthogonal polynomial ensemble. Even if L is orthogonal polynomial ensemble, your favorite very classical orthogonal polynomial ensemble, Hermitian, polynom uh, Hermitian polynomials, so it is completely not clear how to write kernel for such ensemble. So let me point out just the convenience of this very simple proposition is that it allows to work directly with ranges in a situation where it is not possible to write kernels explicitly. And so let me write down a corollary. Let me write down a corollary. Uh, just uh, a corollary. So, uh, corollary. Uh, just, uh, we, we, we shall now, in terms of this, write down a conditional point process under the condition that the point process contains no particles. So, let's consider, so let, so corollary. So, let's consider a subspace B of E, and let's consider the event, let me denote it like this, configurations E, E in without B, is the set of configurations X such that X has no intersection with B, so X has no particles in B. So my claim is, my claim is that the determinantal point process the determinantal point process, PK, restricted to configurations <coughs> E, E without B, well, and obviously normalized. Is again a determinantal point process. Where the kernel, where the kernel is projection, projection onto I, E without B, L, E without B, L. Okay, so let us prove this. In fact, it's one line corollary because in fact, this restriction, so proof occupies really not two lines but one line, so proof is that star is equal to the product of characteristic function of E without B, B, K. Well, obviously normalized. So, so let me write Z inverse so, uh, for normalization. So just, this is just, this is just multiplicative function. So obviously considering the conditional measure with respect to the fact that there are no particles in B, corresponds to considering my measure multiplied by a multiplicative functional with respect to a characteristic function of the complement of B. So, and then applying the previous result, we obtain this property. 
let me again underline, let me underline that, uh, <clears throat> that it is not the same. So there is, in any point process, there is a general procedure of forgetting. You can consider point process on R, and you can forget R minus. Just consider its restriction to R plus. Just forget about R minus. Forgetting just means forgetting on the level of kernels. So take the kernel and forget. So just consider the kernel restricted to R plus, for example. This is not what is happening. So what is there, what, what, is, what is forgetting is forgetting. Here it is not forgetting. Here it is conditioning, conditioning on the fact that there are no particles. It's not that I forget about particles. It's that I say that there are no particles there. And uh, so then it is, I have to, so to speak, forget, but not on the level of, uh, on the level of the subspace, on the level of the subspace, on the level of the subspace. So, okay, Ken gives me this chair of department look, and so, and I just say that tomorrow we will continue with, uh, we will continue with the behavior of determinantal processes under conditioning, and we will prove a lemma, uh, which we proved in joint work with Xu and Shamov, that conditioning both on absence of particles and on presence of particles preserves the determinantal property. Thank you very much.